Well, welcome to uh, Germany. We're going to Germany today, the land of Beethoven, the land of the Kuckucksklock, the land of soccer, of the Black Forest chocolate cake, and also the Holocaust. Uh, my parents uh, are no longer here to tell the story of the Holocaust. They're long gone. And now it's us children who are left to tell the story. We went through it as children. And uh, it's a privilege for me to share with you uh, on the majesty, the greatness, and the mercy of God today. So uh, I want to begin by giving you a couple statements from two great men of God. One is from Oswald Chamber, who said, The greatest thing, the greatest sin, the greatest sin that man can commit is not believing that God is good. As a triple Holocaust survivor, I affirm today that God is good and he's always good. Secondly, I want to bring you a quote from a German theologian, the first one who stood up against the Nazis in defense of the Jews. And uh, he said shortly before he was martyred by the Nazis, discipleship is uh, Jesus calling us to die. When Jesus calls the man, he bids him die. Yes, my dear friends, uh, we're either all for God or not for God at all. So I was born in the fires of affliction. I was raised in the fires of affliction. And I tell you today, affliction is good for us. We need it. If I had to go to life again, I would choose the same path of affliction that I experienced in my childhood. So uh, the, the psalmist said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Because of the afflictions in my early life, the molding and, and the afflictions, God took all the nonsense out of my life early on. Now, there were actually four holocausts, and I want to bring them to you one by one as I'm going into my story. But let's begin with the Nazi holocaust, I mean the Jewish holocaust first. You all remember the uh, Egyptian holocaust and the days of Moses. Moses was the most famous holocaust survivor. It's rather interesting that he survived in the very palace of the king who ordered the Holocaust. Then we had the Persian Holocaust, but averted in the last few hours by Queen Esther. Then we had the Roman Holocaust at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, where one and a half million Jews were crucified in the baking sun outside the walls of Jerusalem. And then throughout history, you had 109 programs, uh, massacres and uh, expulsions of Jews. So the Jews had been the most hated and persecuted people in the world. Now, as far as the Nazi Holocaust, uh, 6 million Jews were killed. One and a half million were killed in gas chambers. And uh, they were pushed into these chambers, men and women respectively, to their shower rooms. They were told to undress, of course, and uh, they're asked to put their arms up straight so that they could jam these bodies together as much as possible. Then instead of water coming out of the uh, shower heads, it was cyclone B gas. Within three to four minutes, all were dead and instantly cremated. The major uh, extermination camps processed, hear me, processed two to 3,000 Jews an hour, about 60,000 Jews a day. Of those uh, six million Jews, there were uh, millions were killed by execution squads as the German army moved towards Moscow. Uh, hundreds uh, or millions were killed 
by gas lamps. Uh, they were picked up by these vehicles and then the exhaust gas was turned inward inside the cabin. The second Holocaust was a non-Jewish, the forgotten Holocaust, and five million uh, people were killed. They were gypsies, they were Poles, they were uh, people who were uh, pastors and priests, they were uh, people who were physically, mentally, mentally handicapped. Um, they were political dissenters. One day my father was in a small cafe and uh, somebody at the table next to him said, uh, it looks like we're gonna lose the war. Instantly a secret servant agent picked him up by the collar and he said, you're arrested. And as far as we know, that man went straight from there to the concentration camp, no trial, no jury. So then uh, we had the uh, third Holocaust was the greatest Holocaust. That was the uh, starvation Holocaust. Here, 18 million people died of starvation, including members of my own family. And then finally you had the bombing Holocaust you read that picture of the bombing back on, uh, where 500,000 people were killed, mostly women and their children and the older ones, the able-bodied were fighting the war, burned alive, hundreds of thousands burned alive, hundreds of thousands buried under the rubble, and tens of thousands died by asphyxiation because when the bombs hit the asphalt, the temperature got to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit and sucked up all the oxygen. So now the whole story actually began in 1933 when there was an election in Germany and uh, the Germans had three choices. The Social Democrats, which had run the country the last 15 years, the communists, or the National Socialistische Partei, uh, the Nazis for short. The uh, Social Democrats had nothing new to offer. Unemployment was 25%, people ate out of garbage cans. The communists were of no great interest to the Germans as a whole. The National Socialistische Partei was, uh, had promises and uh, it made the Germans feel good. And so uh, Adolf Hitler got 44% of the vote. He bullied himself into the position of the chancellor and the dictatorship. So uh, during his run up, he was uh, promoting his anti Semitism in beer halls and over the radio. It was in this kind of environment that my mother began to date a young man called Rudy. And uh, after they dated for quite a prolonged time, it looks like he was going to say the big words. Then suddenly his father called him and he said, son, you can marry anybody but a Jew. And he was a wealthy industrialist. He said, that's bad for the business. My mother was about to jump off a bridge. And the last minute she realized that life was sacred and she changed her mind. Several months passed by, she met another young man, and this time she decided, I better let uh, Alfred know right away at the first day about my Jewish ancestry. So cautiously, little by little, she brought him her background. When she was all done, Alfred put his arms around her and said, I always wanted to marry a Jew. Greater love has no man but that he gives his life for his friends. And so actually Alfred at that point threw his future away. Now we go on from there, 1933 to 1935. And here Adolf Hitler passed the Nuremberg laws which were racial laws, at which time all Germans were classified into three categories, that's racially. So you had the Jews on the one hand, 
the Aryans, the pure Germans on the other hand, and then you have the Mischlinge, the people of mixed race. So in our case, my mother's father was a Jew, full-blooded Jew. He would have to wear the Star of David, of course. Then uh, my father was an Aryan, pure German, and the rest of us, we were uh, of mixed race. We were classified as first and second degree mongrels. We were second degree mongrels, but we, <laughs> first, second degree, I mean, we were people that were subhuman. The Jews, uh, mixed race, and the pure Jews were all considered subhuman. The uh, Aryans were the superhumans, the super beings who would be able to conquer the whole world. So uh, I came along in 1936, and I was the first one who was racially identified as a Jewish descent uh, on a birth card, first one in our family. So when my mother came home from the Nazi office with this uh, card, birth card, uh, she was distraught, absolutely discouraged, hopeless. She was a person not given to uh, religious expressions. She never talked about religion, never talked about Jesus, nothing. But at that point, she opened the scriptures and uh, her eyes fell upon the uh, Psalm 91, verse 11. And there it says, and he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, lest you dash your foot against a stone. As you notice in the margin here, she wrote my name in pencil, Rymar 9836. That was when I was born. Without her being aware of it, I'm sure, she proclaimed a prophecy over my life that I would be indestructible. And so I have been, because there's a God in the heavens. He wanted me to live who had a mission in my life. It reminds me a little bit of Jeremiah. God says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, before I put you together, I ordained you, I called you, I sanctify you to be a prophet to the nations. Well, believe it or not, now I'm writing to nations in eight different languages. Glory to God. So then, uh, of course, uh, it wasn't very long after that, that the Nazis called my dad into the office and said, uh, Alfred, you need to divorce your Jewish family. And then you have a future in uh, the party. My dad said, no, thank you. I love my family. The next day he lost his job. And during this time also, of course, Hitler began to pass all kinds of anti-Semitic laws. For example, uh, he uh, tried to get the Jews out of business. Uh, every Jewish businessman had to put the name Isaac behind his name, like J.C. Penny Isaac, and every woman the name Sarah, so that every store could be identified as being Jewish. So the people would boycott these stores. And uh, some tried to go shopping anyhow, they were mocked, and they were ridiculed. And uh, so the Jews went out of business. Then uh, laws were passed where all Jewish civil servants were dismissed. Then uh, all medical doctors were dismissed. And uh, then uh, the day came and my aunt Hilda, who was a nurse, was asked to sign papers that she was Aryan. She said, I'm Jewish, I'm not Aryan. They said, we cover for you, you'll be all right. She says, no, thank you, I'm proud to be a Jew. The next day she lost her job. Uh, my Jewish grandfather could see the writing on the hand of the on the wall early on and he made his way to England and then later on uh, my aunt followed him to England. All my other Jewish relatives escaped to Brazil and Argentina. So uh, then other Jewish laws were passed. Uh, for example, uh, students uh, were not allowed to go to public school, Jewish uh, students, uh, universities didn't take uh, Jewish students. Signs came up like this one, Jews uh, 
will not be served here in restaurants or other science Jews keep out of the neighborhood and so forth and so on. Now, during this time, uh, we also began to experience the bombings of the British. I survived 1,000 bombing raids. We lived in a fifth floor of an apartment complex and uh, uh, on the average of two to three times a night, the science would take off and we would have to make our way down through the basement and of course in total darkness. So that was the an experience I will never forget. Uh, sometimes the sounds of the sirens are still going through my head. So I actually, I actually uh, uh, was being bombed in my dreams even 10 years after the war was over. I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 19 years of age. And every time I'd go to bed, uh, I would dream the bombs would come through the uh, attic and see all the floors and hit me on the bridge of my nose. And I would break out in cold sweat for 10 years after the war was over. But by this time, I'd become a Christian, and so uh, one day I had the bright idea. I said, Jesus, would you please stop the bombings? And he did. Uh, Christianity is supernatural, praise the Lord. So the Nazis came back to my dad the second time and tried to force him to divorce his Jewish wife and family, and the sec third time, when he came the third time, my dad realized the next time they would probably come with one of these vans. And we made a secret move from Hamburg, Germany to East Germany. You see Hamburg here on the map, and then we go from there eastward to a town called Lauenburg. And you don't move in Germany, you don't move from any apartment to any other place anywhere without a police clearance. But uh, we wanted to uh, buy time, time was life. And so we did not report, of course, and uh, moved to Lauenburg. On this journey, I heard Adolf Hitler speak on radio the first time ever. And he always had the same message, basically the same message. He started out really low and slow, and then worked himself into, up into a high pitch. His basic message was, we're going to establish a thousand year Reich, a thousand year kingdom. When I heard that, I was a seven-year-old boy. Something inside of me came alive. Remember that John the Baptist said of Jesus, this is a light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Think of that. Every person in the world, whether they're born in the Buddhist world or in the Muslim world or in the Jewish world or Hindi world, every person when they're born has the gift of a little light from Jesus. And then on top of that, we all have the gift of a conscience. And then we have the laws of God written in our hearts. And all of this spiritual apparatus begin to come alive in my heart. When he said, we will establish a thousand year right. I knew instantly that this would not be what I'm looking for. Why only a thousand years, I said to myself, there must be the seeds of destruction in this kingdom. And inside of me, deep inside of me, yet buried, but yet coming alive, was this dream of Abraham, who was seeking a builder of a city whose maker was God. Now then also, this is the first time my moral apparatus, my compass begin to operate. And I knew that I was being told a lie. The first time I was being told a lie. We have no idea how sensitive this moral apparatus is before we override it and override it, override it till it becomes losing sensitivity. So uh, I knew I was told a lie because we are being bombed to smithereens. How are we gonna last very long? So then I began to fall. At that point, at seven years of age, I began to fall in love with truth, 
with the invisible things, realizing the invisible things would be indestructible, had no earthly friends. And, uh, but I begin to realize that truth, somehow truth liberates, truth empowers, truth, truth purifies, truth never disappoints, truth builds character, touches everything in the universe, truth gets you out of any trouble, is always beautiful and never brings shame and guilt. That was, of course, in the very beginning stages. But there was the rise and progress of religion in my soul. So going to Lauenburg now, and there uh, my daddy got a job. Uh, he was accountant of a large factory, and he had a rented condo where his job was. So he came home weekends only. His landlady stole his food rations. He got thinner and thinner, got tuberculosis, and died. And now we were in really serious trouble because he was our protector against the Nazis. So the day after he died, my mother went to his desk drawers and there she found uh, two loaded revolvers. He was waiting for the Nazis to come and meet them at the door over his dead body. So now, he was gone. We had four dilemmas. Of course, first of all, our father was dead. Jews were being killed in that neighborhood. Uh, a lady came to my mother and said, uh, you don't believe what I saw, but uh, a big truck crossed the railroad tracks and uh, it was an open truck. Some skirts fell off, bloody skirts fell off. And the driver came and, you know, with a pitchfork threw them back on. And she asked the driver, what is he? He says, I just dirty old bloody Jewish rags. Jews were being killed in our neighborhood. Our father was gone. Uh, then uh, we had uh, the uh, other dilemma there was the Russians were coming. Here's a picture of us children before us. Uh, bring it up there. There we are, uh, Wolfram on the left, and uh, Reimer, that's me, and then Renate and Eckhart. Uh, all of us uh, very teary-eyed because of what was going on. So father was dead, Jews being killed, Russians were coming. Uh, the Germans uh, went all the way to the gates of Moscow. In the process, they killed 26 million Russians. And now the tide turned and Joseph Stalin said, okay, when you go into Germany, have fun. Have fun with the women and do whatever you want to do. Take revenge. And so this is what happened. When the Russians took the first town, it was called Niemersdorf. The uh, Germans took it back the next day and reported what happened. This was a pattern for every German village and town all the way to Berlin. All the women from 8 to 80 had been tied to barn doors and wagon wheels and abused. All the old men had been clubbed to death and all the babies had their heads crushed. And when they came into my town, they took all the wounded soldiers out of the hospital, laid them on the pavement and ran their tanks over them. This went on the radio. And within just uh, a few weeks, 12 million Germans became refugees, walked out into the deep snow ahead of the Russian advance. We became part of those 12 million people. So here we were in uh, our town of Lauenburg, surrounded by the Red Army, with just one opening of a railroad track. Uh, Horse-drawn carriages were just lined up on every road of our town, open carriages with refugees, skinny horses. My brother, older brother, went to the schoolyard. There were 1,000 young German uniformed soldiers stacked up with their tongues sticking out, no place, no time to bury them. And so here we were. <laughs> Where is this? And he will give us angels charge over you to keep you in all your, where is it? How's God, how's God going to do this? Because I didn't know God yet, but God had his eyes on me indeed. And so, uh, yes, the mayor, the burgomaster, got on radio 
and said, uh, well, he said, everybody wants to get out. We can only hold the town one more day. Uh, and we try to get this Red Cross hospital train out, and then we have to turn it over to the Russians. We can't hold it longer. But there's standing room uh, on this train where we have triple bunk beds, triple high. And uh, so the requirements to get on the train are these. Uh, we will take families where there are uh, at least three or more children. We qualify for that. And the children had to be half or full orphans. We qualified for that. And there has to be at least one infant. Well, the fifth child had just been born. We qualified for that. So, yes. He will have his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. My father had to die. My The baby, the fifth child, had to be born to get us out of the hands of the communists. So I still recall my mother standing in our lovely living room. We children were gathered around and she was not used to making decisions. And she said to us, children, shall we stay or shall we go? And with a single voice, we said, let's get out of here. Later on, she wrote in her memoirs, I took the voices of my children as the voice of God. So uh, we got ready to go to the railroad station. Of course, we didn't go to the bank. We didn't go to the grocery store. We wanted to be sure we didn't lose our spot because everybody wanted to get out. And so uh, I was the always the one that was, uh, had the strangest ideas. So I... I decided to take my feather bed with me. <laughs> I took it on my back, fell over backwards, and we all had the last laugh for a while. So my mother, all she could do was carry the baby in her arms. It was snowing heavily. The snow was knee deep for us children. And we made our way to the railroad station. And there we had to stand all night. There were no benches uh, waiting for the wounded to be loaded on. And then finally in the morning, we were getting on the train and we were jammed body to body like sardines. And the doors closed up. And what was supposed to have taken two hours on the train took three days and two nights jammed together, standing together. No heat, no uh, uh, food, no water, uh, no medication, painkillers for the wounded. I had a man die uh, lie next to me. He was dead for two days before we put him out in the snow. The Germans and Russians fought over the railroad tracks ahead of us. But uh, he will have his angels charged over you to keep you in all your ways. So we finally made it through. And now we want the map back up. We uh, got to Danzig, Danzig, which is now Gdansk. Uh, what happened is the Russians advanced coming from the east then they, they moved around there's a pocket here uh and danzig uh Gdansk, that was holding out we were in this pocket uh the russians were on the east of us the south of us the west of us uh and we were two million people in this pocket uh, no food came in no ammunition came in uh our supplies came in for the armies and we were being just uh, blasted to pieces. We were being bombed and the, our territory became smaller and smaller. The only way out, possible out was by sea. And so uh, Adolf Hitler sent a bunch of uh, ships to pick up refugees to move them from there to West Germany. My brother and I found a ship loading up with refugees and we told our mother and once again, she gathered us around her and said, shall we stay or shall we go? And you ask, well, why was that a question, knowing what the Russians would do? Uh, the reason was, she didn't tell us that at the time. Just before that, one, uh, in fact, the largest uh, ship, the largest luxury liner of Germany with swimming pool and all that stuff, had taken on 10,000 refugees and wounded soldiers. And it was being destroyed by Russian submarines. In a matter of minutes, it went down to the bottom of the sea, taking 9,500 refugees and wounded with them. All the lifeboats were frozen position. And that continued to be uh, 
a problem. Altogether, 22,000 refugees drowned in the ice cold waters in this escape. So that's why she said, shall we go or shall we stay? The chance of being drowning in the Baltic Sea or being uh, suffering humiliation by the Russians. With a single voice, we once again said, let's get out of here. And so we made our way to the ship. And uh, this is the actual ship that you see there called the Orion. And uh, people were lined up by the thousands and thousands. Now, the requirements to get on the ship were these, that every only one, every family had to have one baby. The baby, the infant, was the ticket to get on the ship. No men were allowed on. When men tried to, some men tried to dress like women, and they were immediately shot by the SS and their bodies were hung on lampposts. Also, another thing I mentioned, forgot to mention earlier, to getting on the train and getting on the ship, the normal procedure was always you have to show your ID. And they didn't, either way, by God's grace, they didn't ask for our ID with our Jewish designation. We would never have gotten on these, uh, the ship or the train. So we got on the train, uh, the ship, and uh, we were all told to lie down on the steel riveted floor, body to body. Let's take the next uh, picture of the ship. Uh, they were really loaded. There you are. That was the picture. And uh, imagine that in freezing cold weather and snowing and not knowing for sure whether they would be blown up or not and how long it would it take to get there. Of course, there was no food, no water, nothing there for us. Uh, uh, so we, uh, 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 um, Minesweeper took us out of the harbor and then uh, we were on our own. Uh, sailors were let down on boards on the left and right side of the bow and they were given long poles to push the water mines out of the way. There were uh, 60,000 mines in the Baltic Sea. After three days, uh, three and a half days of travel, we arrived in, almost arrived in West Germany. The harbors were mine shut. The ship took us to Copenhagen. And there, uh, all the babies died of starvation because uh, our mothers had not had anything to eat for about uh, seven to 10 days. So my baby sister was buried uh, four to a box uh, under the banner of the swastika along with other 1,000 babies. Uh, we were put into boxcars and moved uh, for hours. We didn't know where we were going. And then when the doors opened up, we saw a barbed wire. We saw watchtower towers. We saw soldiers with machine guns. We saw German shepherd dogs and we found a home for a detention camp for the next two years. 36,000 people, 17 people in one room. And I want you to know this was a wonderful, good experience. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I remember so much of that. Uh, of course, we all we had is, you know, 17 one room. We had just bunk beds and that was it, a table in the middle and a few chairs. Uh, our food was uh, green bread, uh, green bread once a day, molded bread. And uh, once in a while we had some soup, of course, you never find any meat in it. But anyhow, and in those two years, nobody ever complained. Although we had lice, we had fleas. Uh, I killed a mouse one time on my bed accidentally. Uh, of course, we had uh, no hot water. Uh, no pillows, just a few pieces of straw we lay on. But in those two years, nobody ever complained. Why not? For two reasons. One, we got away from the Russians. Oh, we were thankful for that. Secondly, there were 18 million people who wished they had green bread so they could live, but they didn't. So we were blessed. Then I had a tremendous mother. Uh, she was positive. Uh, her name could have been yes, 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 under any circumstance. 
So she told us not to look at things or think about things we didn't have, but to look at things we did have. And uh, what did we have? We had feet by which to walk. We had hands by which to handle things. We had eyes by which to see. We had ears by which to hear. And we had a working brain. It's all part of it. So <laughs> we learned to appreciate the basics because there were people who didn't have all of that. And of course, later on, I found God. That was a great plus, the plus of all pluses. So uh, we, uh, uh, first year, we boys carved chess figures out of trees. And uh, then I played chess six days a week. That was uh, my education for that first year. At the end of the uh, first year, uh, the parents got together, 36,000 people, I mean, their brains there, uh, and they said, let's, uh, let's start a school system. So we started elementary school, high school, university, without textbooks, without notebooks, without pencils. Just a teacher, we had empty barracks, uh, people died, and the uh, teacher had a chalkboard, piece of chalk, and that was it. Now, the first thing that we had to learn in public school was the great German hymn, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, ein gute Wehr und Waffen. There it is. And I, uh, in Germany, there's no separation of church and state. Uh, and there I lay on the top bunk and I was, for the first time, I was thinking about God. Who is God? Where is God? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and what is this all about? And so I was like the little boy Samuel. I felt like somebody was calling me, but I didn't know who and what. And so uh, that experience went by, but uh, I never got over that. A mighty fortress is our God. So uh, after a year, another year, two years in the camp, we uh, got out and we got back to Hamburg. And once again, we were moved into barracks. Here you see Hamburg on the left, a beautiful sea. You see the canal there on the right. The next one is in color. Um, there it is. 72% of every major city was rubble, 72%. Uh, shortly after we left Hamburg, make that sacred move out of Hamburg, our block was hit. It's called the Night of Gomorrah, Operation Gomorrah by the British. 900 some bombers came over our city with firebombs. And the next day, 42,000 people were dead. In one night, in one city, 42,000 people were dead by the bombs. Had I not moved, had my dad not moved us out at that time, I would not be here today. So thank the Lord. He will give us angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. So where do you move? Where do you go? <laughs> Going back home? There are no homes. There are no apartments. And uh, then you had 12 million people coming in from East Germany into West Germany. Where are they going to live? Barracks, barracks, barracks. So we were back in the barracks again. And here, of course, we, uh, uh, again, there's no, no heat in the barracks, uh, broken window. Uh, and uh, so we had uh, two bunk beds for five of us. And here, uh, it was so cold that uh, several weeks, we spent 20, 22 hours or 23 hours a day under the blankets in bed. And uh, one night, they were all chattering. <laughs> And my mother had the audacity to say, children, don't we have it good? We were chattering away and said, mother, tell us all about this. She said, well, she said, this is the first time in two years that we as a family have our own private room together. Isn't that great? Yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is. I want to tell you something. Uh, I don't know how much influence you have if you as a parent, as a parent, 
are maintaining a positive attitude, a thankful attitude in every circumstance of life. Uh, it got into me. I wasn't even a Christian. Didn't know what Christianity was. But uh, when my mother died, she died in a large, huge retirement home. Um, when she died, uh, all the staff gathered at the staff desk and they all wept profusely. Uh, well, people die there all the time. And uh, they did because every time they went into a room, even just to adjust a little blanket, she said in a beautiful German accent, thank you very much, thank you very much, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, without my mother knowing what she was doing, uh, she was preparing me to walk with God way back there. And she taught us absolute obedience the first time around. Uh, she would not tolerate disobedience. She uh, uh, almost beat it out of me. She didn't have to because she never, she tried to beat it out of me, the disobedience out of me. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, my job was to keep the fire burning and the coal burning stove. And uh, we had this long steel rod, this poker. And if I wouldn't obey, she would uh, pull that poker out and she would chase me around the dining room table. <laughs> but uh, I ran for my life. And she ran because she was angry, so I always beat her to it. But I got the idea, I, get, I learned to obey instantly, praise the Lord. If we don't obey God consistently, he cannot use us. He cannot use us. We've got to obey all the time. No excuses. Yeah, no excuses. And she got me to the point of no excuses. And it helps me tremendously in my Christian life. No excuse for not having my prayers in the morning, reading the Bible, witnessing for Jesus. No excuses. God cannot use people who are excuse makers. We've got to get it out of us. So thank God for my mother. One day we... Uh, lived in a basement of a little old farmhouse and uh, an unforgettable experience. Uh, to walk to school, I had to uh, go on top of a cobblestone dam, 45 minutes on top of a cobblestone dam. And uh, so one day I was just out a little bit and I got in this tremendous thunderstorm. I mean, I thought it was going to be swept away and drowned, uh, whatever, soaking wet. I turned back obviously turned back home i got into that basement there with a hardwood floor and he and my mother was greeting me uh she had turned into a 10-foot fire spitting dragon and she let me have it you good for nothing uh you will not amount to anything you're lazy you're bum and uh so you have no future as a big lake formed around my feet on the hardwood floor I made my way into the closet. I slept in the closet on the floor, a little bit of straw, and uh, I had one bed sheet. That's all I had to cover myself. And well, we had mice running all over, so I pulled the bed sheet over my face. And uh, then I began to think and think and think. You know, that's the problem with kids today. Uh, they all have cell phones and they're, they're texting, texting, and receiving, and they're responding to information. They never take time to think what they're doing to others, how they relate to others, and, and what, the, what life's all about. So I got to realize that of all the things my mother had gone through, I never wanted to disappoint her again. And I there concluded that uh, I will never tolerate another excuse for the rest of my life. Praise God. That was at 12 years of age. Now then, uh, my mother was also uh, uh, very courageous. Uh, one day we were out of food, it happened several times. And uh, so uh, she couldn't get any food. She had black tea. Uh, she got it from my Jewish grandfather, from my dad. She, he mailed it to Germany. She got the tea as a bargaining tool to get bread or potatoes. Well, she couldn't get any bargaining deals where we were and so my mother slipped through the iron curtain she had learned a little russian in the camp and uh she slipped through all the security guards and then she went from farmhouse to farmhouse there in the villages 
from morning till night, day one, no deal, slept in the barn. Day two, from morning till night, farmhouse to farmhouse, no deal, slept in the barn. Next day, she got finally got a deal. She got a bag of potatoes for uh, a little bit of tea. She came home triumphant, positive, and then we ate rotten tomatoes for a while. But in all this, we remain, and she remained thankful for what we had. Praise the Lord. So she also also taught us not to blame anything for our problems. Anyhow, now uh, I got to be 13 years of age, and one day I took my old bicycle into the forest, out of the rubble into the forest. I had no tent, I had no blanket to cover myself. Uh, so I just covered myself with pine branches for the night. And then in the morning, the ants were crawling up my legs. It woke me up, I stood up, I heard the song of a beautiful nightingale sing, sing the glories of God. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Christianity at this point yet. And then, all of a sudden, as the golden beams of the sun came through the trees, I heard a voice speak to me in perfect German. And the voice said, Ich liebe dich, ich liebe dich, ich bin Liebe. I love you, I love you, I am love. That's the first time in my life I ever heard anybody say to me, I love you. Oh, what a wonderful God. He saw that little bundle of humanity, 13 year old kid, under the pine branches in the forest. And my friend, I want to tell you, just as he told me, he saw where I was. You can't hide from God. He saw where I was. And he knew me. And he told me, I love you. He's telling you, I love you. I know where you are. I love you. I care about you right now. And so uh, then, uh, after that unforgettable experience, three years transpired without any religious uh, experiences. And uh, we start high school at 12, we finish at 16. So I was the shyest boy in an all boys high school. And I sit way back in the corner, the tall guys in the corner with the big benches. I was, uh, I never had said a word, hadn't said a word in four years. I was withdrawn, very much withdrawn. And the day came when our professor presented Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And as he went through it, there was this inner light. This inner light came back on again. It says, not true, not true. And then my reasoning, my intellect couldn't accept it. It was nonsense. And so when the professor was done with Darwin, he said, is there anybody in class who would like to dispute the Darwinian theory. And all of a sudden, instantly, I came up like a rocket and I said, ich muss morgen dagegen sprechen. I said, I must speak against this tomorrow. And I was absolutely petrified. <laughs> and the class was absolutely electrified. <laughs> after four years, finally after four years, Schultz is going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what I would say, but the Holy Spirit picked me up, not knowing God in a personal way, but he picked me up. He made me say it. Ich muss morgen dagegen sprechen. The teacher this, uh, said, you have the whole science out tomorrow. So I went home and up the cobblestone road to our apartment, and I said, Mutti, I said, Mother, do you have a Bible? She handed me good old Martin Luther's Bible, still in the old German script. And I, I looked in the last book because I was going to be a scientist. So the last book would be most up to date, the Revelation. I couldn't, I, I couldn't make sense of anything there. I lasted two or three minutes, and I said, God, you got me into this, and you're going to have to get me out of this. So I just planned to go before the class and be embarrassed and get on with life. So I slept well that night, got before the class, and they looked at me, and I looked at them. It seemed for hours. Then all of a sudden the words came to me and I said, es kann nicht sein, es kann nicht sein, es muss einen Gott geben, es muss einen Gott geben. It cannot be, cannot be, there must be a God 
that it must be God. I waited for further words. They did not come. And I made my way back to the seat, the corner seat. And as I was sliding into the bench, the glory of God came all over me. All over me. I didn't have the word glory in my vocabulary, but that's what it was. And God spoke to me the second time. You see, I've been wondering here. I am uh, graduating from school and I'm not ready to graduate. I don't know where I came from. I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know where I'm going when I die. I was in despair. And now I heard the voice of God the second time in the glory. He said to me, I will give you the answers to the questions of origin, purpose, and destiny. And I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. And here, my friend, God gave me my lifelong assignment. That's what I'm doing as a writer. I've been writing the last 10 years about origin, purpose, and destiny, the three greatest questions of life. So I see the time is running on. Uh, six months later, I read the Bible for the next six months, prayed, read the Bible, six months, nothing. I got nothing out of the Bible, absolutely nothing out of the Bible. But I persevered. You know, it says in the book of Jeremiah, it says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And conversely, if you don't seek me with all your heart, you will not find me. Well, I was seeking God with all my heart. <laughs> and so uh, I'll tell all of you, it may be a while, but don't give up if you stay with it. If you forsake everything else, let everything else go and make God your only pursuit. You will find him. He will reveal himself to you. So uh, in this process of the six months, towards the end of the six months, I did find two verses that made sense. One was, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking shall be opened unto you. And I said, Jesus, is there anybody ever who's done that? I'm the one. And then I found a passage of all places in the Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dwell with him and he with me. I said, that's me. Well, praise God. A month later, I was in England visiting my Jewish grandfather. And there I found Jesus. I asked him to come into my heart. Then coming back to Germany, I was immediately tested. Most people say, hey, you come to Jesus and all will be fine and dandy. Uh, it'll be prosperity theology. I want you to know when Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was driven into a, a wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. You'll be tested, tried, and refined. Be faithful. So I got into a storm on the... Uh, British Channel, crossing the British Channel, and there we were on this ship, and it was it was very stormy. I was not allowed to go underneath uh, because it was a third class passenger. I had no food. I missed my grandfather. He's supposed to give me food on the way down back to Germany, and uh, empty stomach, hanging over the rails, raining, and I was looking in the Black Sea, and all of a sudden I knew there was a devil. I knew there was a devil. The devil said to me. Mr. Schultze, how do you like being a Christian? I said, you old devil, if I would go to hell, I would talk of Jesus until you spit me out of there. And there, my friend, I made my marriage agreement with God for better or worse. I would be faithful to him. And there I took out my reverse gear. I would never turn back to not following Jesus. And uh, by God's grace, only by the grace of God, I've been true, holding true to that for 65 some years. Coming back to Germany, of course, I knew I had to witness for Jesus. That's one of the essentials. We cannot keep the joy of the Lord unless we witness. Witness and witness, obey, witness, pray, and read the Bible. Those are the four basic essentials. So my first witness was to my mother, and she gave me a cold shoulder. My next witness was to my scoutmaster of the Lutheran scout movement. And he uh, 
He asked me how old was, how my trip was. I said, Mr. Dr. Bratner, I want you to know I received Jesus from my heart. And he turned at me, his face turned red. He said, blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. And I was excommunicated from the Christian Boy Scouts of Germany. Then I found another young man, and uh, he and I together started an underground Christian Boy Scout movement, and we named it Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Remember when I started out, I said Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him die. That was our commitment.